Hi, and welcome to Comedy Wham Presents. I'm Laura Smith. During his recent tour through Texas, comedian Shane Moss was kind enough to sit down with me and talk about his background, career, and what's next. Recorded outside of the studio, the audio quality does have some background noise, but the content is well worth it. And now, Comedy Wham presents Shane Moss. Hi, this is Laura, a correspondent for Comedy Wham presents, and I am sitting down with Shane Moss. Hello. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me. So, uh, I saw your show last night, and it was incredible. Oh, thank you. Um, so, we're going to talk a little bit about your past right now, okay. and get everybody <laughs> caught up speed on Shane Moss, and then we'll go from there. All right, sounds good. Um, so, you are from, is it La Crosse, Wisconsin? Yes. Or, okay, is that well, it's you? outside of it. Okay. I, I say La Crosse, yeah. Okay. And uh, what was it like growing up there? Well... I had a very, uh, a very small town, Pleasantville kind of upbringing, and the mm-hmm. people there are like very sheltered, and right. um, and I didn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't the best environment for um, creativity or thinking right. differently than other people, and. I was raised very strictly religious, and um, I kind of didn't like that. Right. Uh, I, I wasn't. I wasn't buying into it, and so I had a lot of like angst. E- even before my teenage years, I yeah. was I was kind of an angsty kid. I was pretty quiet, kept to myself. I kind of thought I was crazy because oh, yeah. everyone thought seemed to think differently than I did, mm-hmm. but. Um, Fortunately, now I know they were just wrong. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, did you know, like, at what point did you know that you wanted to do comedy? How did how did you get into that? Uh, I think I was like 10 years old. A friend of mine said that I should be a stand-up comedian. Oh, wow. And um, I didn't even know what that was. He's like, oh, it's someone that stands on the stage and makes people laugh. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's a good idea. Right. And so it was just in my head. Ever ever since that time, I just always figured I would do that. That's incredible. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize so early on what they yeah. want to do. And was it something that you started working towards then and there, or was it something that you kind of filed in the back of your mind? Yeah, How it was, did it come it was about? just you know like my dream, and I would always like have all these. I would always in school be de- daydreaming about sitting on the couch and uh, on late night television you know and <laughs> telling jokes and stuff I was always I would always like think through situations I, I was good at I was good at predicting um, like future situations or like oh next time that happens I'm gonna say this right and uh that took a lot of my attention. Mm-hmm. So jokes were always on my mind. I didn't start actually like writing down jokes and stuff until I was like 14 or 15. Okay. And then, um, and even then it wasn't terribly serious. Right. Um, and then I, I wanted to move out of high school, but I, was, I tried to save up. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was trying to save up some money first before moving. I ended up drinking all my money away. And and um, when I was 23, I was like, I realized it had been five years since I had left high school and I was working in this factory, not doing anything that I wanted to be doing with my life. And right. that's when I finally made the leap to move to Boston and okay. started out there. So when did you do, like, did you do an open mic or when did you do your first actual stand-up gig? Yeah, it was, uh, I, I, well, I did a little spot on the Showcase Club, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, just did a few minutes, and it was, like, terrifying, and then the, the owner of the club, um, Rick Jenkins at the, at the comedy studio told me that I should take a, 
stand up class or consider taking a class. Mm -hmm. And so I did with this guy out there, Rich Gustus, um, who became a good friend of mine and was, was a real good joke writer and, and, uh, and writing was my strong suit, so he appreciated that and helped me out a lot. And started doing open mics and uh, really awful open mics and then two months later I did my first spot back at the comedy studio and it went really really well and, um, and I was just kind of off and running right away after that. A lot, a lot of local comics saw me in, uh, around and recommended me to other shows and that sort of thing. And, so yeah, it didn't take long. So that, would that have been like, I guess your turning point, kind of realizing that this is gonna actually pan out when you had a good, yeah, I mean, had I a good experience. I didn't give myself much of a choice, but um, definitely, um, I mean, my back was very much against the wall. I didn't have a college education or anything to fall back on, and right. I, I knew I would not do factory work for the rest of my life. But yeah, I think I think I I may not have understood how hard it was going to be and especially considering how easy I had it. Right. And it was still very difficult and trying and So you feel like you did have it easy? Well I moved up really quickly okay. and caught breaks very early on and I was on Conan and yeah. Less than three years and stuff. And, and you, so. you've been on Conan and, and his different iterations at least five times. Right? Yeah, five times now. So. Yeah, yeah, they've been nice to me. <laughs> and then uh, I know you've been on Kemmel mm -hmm. and you've done, uh, let's see. I got a Netflix special called Mating, Mating season, season and I have a, I had a Comedy Central Presents, which mm -hmm. is on Amazon and stuff. And then your first album. Within, Jokes like, to make my parents proud. I think, that, I think it came out in 2010. And then your most recent one. Yeah, my big, my big break, break about breaking both of my feet. Oh, that one went pretty quickly to the top of the iTunes comedy. Yeah, you know, that stuff is like... It's, yeah. a, it's so minute by minute. It, it's it's a nice thing to like be able to promote that yeah. it went to the top of... But it's... It's so it's so fleeting and it changes so so quickly. So, I mean, it was really nice. My my first album never never hit number one, and my first album was pretty successful. And um, so yeah, it was it was nice. But it doesn't you play that stuff up. It, it doesn't it doesn't mean as much as like you kind of promote it. You know, you're you're trying to sell yourself and whatnot. But it's. Because so few albums are bought, comedy albums are bought that, and it, and it's updated like every few hours or whatever. Right. So all that needs to happen is people go on a little streak of buying your album right. for a few hours, and you do some good promotion for it or whatever, and then it goes up in the charts, and then more people click on it and stuff. And it really, I mean, if it would have stayed up there for like a couple months or something like that that would have been significant but right. uh, but yeah it's, uh, it, it, it's not that big of a deal but it, it was nice I was, I was more importantly it was um, an album that I was just really really proud of and mm -hmm. I liked the material and I thought it was my most intelligent work it's, today it's really good yeah. I had seen you kind of touring through here, of course, I think we already talked about that before we were recording, but, and I had seen you talk about the experience in person, but I, I've still listened to the album two or three times, even having seen you perform uh, some of it, you. and, uh, but let's get back to, okay, so you started in Boston, and then where did you go from there? I was there for about six years, then I moved to Austin for a couple of years, mm -hmm. so I was around here, and then I moved to L.A., and I've been there for a few years now. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, what would you say, you know, I hate to sound cliche, but what would you say that your biggest comedy influences were while you were developing? Well, see, I had the, I had the idea to be a, that I had it in my mind that I wanted to be a stand-up comic, before I'd ever even seen stand-up comedy. I'd never even right. seen it. And, um, cause I, I wouldn't have been allowed to watch that stuff, really, right. um, at, at that age. 
And so when I was probably more like 13 or so and had cable, then I watched, I watched every single stand-up thing that Comedy Central ever put on. I mean, every single thing. Up until, up until I recorded my Comedy Central Presents and then I just kind of dropped off and got behind on it. But I used to watch stand-up comedy every single day. And um, I didn't really, there wasn't ever like one person that I idolized or anything. There were, there were a lot, there were a lot of people that I liked a lot. Um, I remember really liking um, Stephen Wright mm -hmm. and um, it, it, really it was like Comedy Central. I grew up on Comedy Central Presents. I didn't grow up on like um, George Carlin albums and that sort of thing. I didn't even discover, I didn't, I never really even listened to George Carlin until after I was a comedian for the most part. And so, like I remember when I was young, I really liked like Nick Swartzen and, um, and Todd Berry and um, Zach Galifianakis and, you know, I was a big, I was a big Chappelle fan when that show came. Of course, I was already a comedian by that time, but um, I liked Half Baked and everything. I it, so I, I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't know how much of an influence anyone had on me. You I liked watching like old people, or, or I, I mean not old, people, bad. I liked watching bad people, right? Because I liked seeing like what I thought they were doing wrong. And why their jokes weren't funny and because they'd be like too it. predictable or something like that, yeah. And so, um, so I kind of liked that just as much as watching the good comedy. So, yeah. I won't ask you to name those people, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, I, I couldn't even do um, it if I wanted to. But, well, so how do you feel like your stand up has developed? And I kind of have an idea of. Like, you bring a lot of science to the table now and stuff. Was it always like that, or is that something? No, I mean, I guess I... People always thought that I was, like, a smart joke writer. But a lot of my subject matter was just, like, drinking and sex and, and stuff that 20-somethings are into. And um, it developed kind of slowly, I guess. I, when I first started traveling internationally, a lot of people did like these festivals, like these one-man show kind of things, and I, um, I, I started trying to think of what that could be if I were to do a one-man show, and at the time... I realized I had a lot of time travel jokes in my act, not intentionally, I just happened to, so I was like, well, I already have all these jokes, maybe I could do a whole thing about time travel. Yeah. So I started writing more time travel jokes, which led me to like reading more physics stuff. And then, um, and then I, I tried to put together a show about physics, and I didn't have much success for it, it with it because I still I'm a club comic predominantly and doing long form stuff is just harder in clubs and just um, the silly easier jokes seem to work better. But um, but then after I had a I got out of a I had a pretty bad breakup and then I had uh, I met a new girl and we were watching a lot of Animal Planet. Um, at the time, and so I was writing a lot of jokes about animals and a lot of jokes about sex, because uh, I was having a lot. And then, um, it was like, um, it, so, so then I thought maybe I'd like make a show about the science of sex or something like that, because my management was always hounding me to put together some show. So then I started reading a lot more evolutionary psychology and biology stuff, which I was already into, but I started reading it a lot more. And it just kind of changed the way that I saw the world, and, um, and I realized just doing one or two jokes here and there was kind of hard because it's, it takes a long time to set up right. some of the stuff, so 
it's much easier to kind of set up a subject and then keep telling jokes about it. Um, and that's kind of how I got to start doing these more like themed shows, which is just more fun. And um, it's hard it's hard to create them in the beginning, but once once they start coming together, they it, it's really easy and it's easy to tie new material into it. And, and so, you you know your your one before this tour was uh, your big break. Yep. Where you talked about breaking both your feet. Yeah. And. Um, I imagine that probably influenced your writing and stuff, having that kind of experience, probably. Yeah, I was, um, I was writing a show at the time about kind of um, the evolution of negative emotions, mm -hmm. and I was also um, writing a lot about um, aggression mm -hmm. at the time. And, and the show was coming together, but then I broke both of my feet, and then it just like fit really well into the negative emotion stuff, like kind of how we hold on to negative memories more than mm -hmm. positive ones a lot of times. And, and so, um, so really just, it came together really quickly. Um, it wasn't all that hard to put it together once, because I, kind of had the framework in place, right. so so really even though, um, you know, it's, it's titled that and both my feet were broken and everything, about half of the material was already written before. Oh really? Yeah, I, I broke my feet and then it, it just kind of, it just kind of flowed well with that. And then when, when you're forced to, I mean, when, when you're on crutches, you get you have to make some jokes about it, so yeah. I was really forced to sit down and write jokes for it, so uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't all that hard to put it all together, um, and then it's just like the fine tuning it once all of it's, once all of it's together, so uh, yeah, I, I, I really like that album. And so your new tour is, the shows you're doing, it's called A Good Trip, mm -hmm. right, with Shane Moss? Yeah. And it's all about your experiences with psychedelics. And yeah. I know that you definitely picked Austin for the tour because Austin is a very psychedelic friendly place. Did you kind of have to schedule this tour based on those kinds of friendly cities or did you just kind of... No. I. So I, I have a regular club act that I do that isn't about psychedelics okay. at all. So I just do that in regular clubs, like Thursday through Saturday, gotcha. for example, um, and clubs around Dallas, uh, Thursday through Saturday, um, and so then on my off nights, I usually find, usually it's like small little indie venues and stuff, but um, sometimes it's bigger venues. So we got a special treat last night. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that was, that was the biggest turnout that I've had for it, too. That's incredible. So, yeah. so then let me ask you this. Um, I know that you do talk about psychedelics a lot. I've heard you talk about them on podcasts, mm -hmm. on your own podcast, and on other podcasts that you've been a guest on. Um, is there something specific that you hope to learn? Because I know you seem pretty, you seem fairly methodical when you take them, almost like in an experiment way. It's not, an experiment. Not well, like, oh, I just want to have fun and woo -hoo, but really, I want to learn something. Yeah, I'm running studies. And so, what do you? Oh, you are. I mean, I mean, like it's, it's right, like, right, like what I'm. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not a scientist, and I'm not like making. I'm not publishing journals or anything. Right. But I do look at it as like running a study, and mm -hmm. usually I, I try to, um, I try to notice. Um, Things that, so if I do them with other people, I'll mm -hmm. I'll try to ask them about their experiences. I can sometimes be a little annoying, like, <laughs> like I'm investigating them or something like that. But I'm I'm trying to figure out um, how the the inner working of the mind works on there. I think that there's many consciousnesses. I I, I think that there's 
I think that there's agents, kind of, in our in our non-conscious um, that take forms of like cities or beings, like um, like we all wear many hats. Like right now, you're a podcast host, and other times, you know, there people people have to be an employee or a boss or a daughter or a mother or you know so or a student or whatever it might be you uh, you know you're wearing all these many hats mm -hmm. um, and and there has to be kind of these different mechanisms in charge of these uh, various kind of lives that we that we lead and so scientists kind of are aware of that but they don't understand how it's happening or what it looks like and they know what like neurons are doing on like a neuron to neuron level right. and they understand these kind of neural patterns that that arise where some of these neurons uh, saying as neurons that fire to get together wire together they start kind of grouping together so there's like these fixed action patterns so there a bit of a bit of stimulus comes in and then it fires off the appropriate um, response and and um, so they know like the very small level and then they have these very faint almost philosophical ideas mm. about what's happening on a bigger level and, um, and I think psychedelics are a window into that world I mean I've seen things I, I had a podcast I had a podcast guest, Matt Lieberman, who I talked with him afterwards, because in his book, he said some, some neuroscientists think that our brains are like running simulations all, all of the time. So, so for example, as I'm talking right now, every, every word that I'm choosing, my brain's running a series of simulations kind of predicting... Um, what kind of effect these words are going to have. Is this going to make me sound crazy? Is this clear enough? You know, am I articulating what I want to be articulating? And so, so does it play out kind of these scenarios in this very split second thing before these words come out of my mouth? And, and a, a lot of people think that's just simply too much processing. Like that it's something else is happening because it can't be can't be this simulation theory but I've seen simulations I've seen my whole life play out fully on DMT um, where and that's I, in like I've 10 seen, minutes or something right you've got yeah. a very short window of time for those yeah I saw like uh, various choices that I could make at this particular point in my life and then I saw all of these different outcomes and and um, I mean, I guess you can't call that proof since it's anecdotal evidence, but if Well, but then you have people saying, that are qualitative researchers, and that's pretty much all they do is take anecdotal evidence and compile. So yeah, I mean, if, if, if the brain doesn't run simulations like this, then how did I see simulations? Right. It has to be. And, um, and, and so there's these things that, that I think could provide a window... Um, to understanding how our minds work, and I think that I think there's a real um, I think that's that what what we consciously want and what our instincts and everything evolved for us to do are are two different things. But but not only that, but I also think that there's just this this barrier in communication between the conscious and non-conscious brain and I think how the how the non-conscious brain tries to tell our consciousness what to do is is through these like feelings mm -hmm. that we have to get that get us to act in these certain ways or, or it kind of creates metaphors or stories mm -hmm. for us that we then um, but, but this is a very roundabout way of giving instructions and and if you think about like Okay, today I want to exercise. Come on, brain, let's do it. Let's exercise. Well, whatever message is coming from your consciousness is somehow being turned into 
you know, we don't really know what that environment looks like when it's the neurons. Say, right. say you have a conscious thing, a conscious things in your non-conscious brain. What's that look like? Probably, I mean, there's a lot of fractals on DMT, and fractals are uh, a way of of, um, of fitting um, infinite space in a finite space, which is counterintuitive, but it's somehow possible. And so, maybe a good way of storing and delivering information is in these little packets of, of, right. of fractals, uh, on this level of perception that, um, that there's no way to see otherwise. And, and so, um, I mean, I look at psychedelics like uh, I'm collecting information. Um, I mean, I don't even, it's not even, um, it's not even all that fun for me a lot of times. Like, yeah. I'm all, often nervous to do it and everything else, but... Um, so writing a whole show around it had to be an interesting challenge. Yeah, there's challenges. It also, I mean, I just had a lot of material about psychedelics mm -hmm. that I'd do like maybe five minutes here, five minutes there at a club I could maybe get away with if it's a cool seeming crowd or whatever. But I couldn't, um, I couldn't do much more than that. Like, if I did like ten minutes, yeah, I would start getting some weird looks from people. Yeah. And, and, um... Really, all that happened was one day I had to do a headlining set and there was no audience there because of weather problems. There's just comics and some, for whatever reason they made me perform anyway. So I didn't want to do my regular shtick and I had I had planned on putting together a show about psychedelics eventually, years down the line. And um, so since this is just a thing that's like in my kind of file cabinet of jokes. Yeah. I just kind of pulled out what I what I could remember. And um and I pulled like an hour of psychedelic jokes like right out of my ass and so it was a great show. And uh, well this was originally and then so since then then I then I started I was like, oh okay, well maybe I can make this a show and then yeah. I started crafting it and you know, changing the order of things and constructing this narrative and figuring out how to how to articulate some of these ideas and how to articulate what these experiences are like is is the real challenge. Yeah. Trying to communicate what psychedelics feel like and do to you. Or, uh, so, do you think it will be an album? Do you think you'll turn that one into? It'll definitely be an album. I'm hoping it'll be a awesome. special. That would be great. I should know pretty soon. Yeah. So then that leads me to this. What what projects are you working on uh, right now? And, and is there anything that you want to promote? I know you still are doing the Here We Are podcast. Yeah, I, my podcast. Uh, each week I have a new scientist on talking about why we behave the way we do and that sort of thing. And um, so so yeah, that uh, it means a lot to me. And um, I'm I'm pretty proud of it. It's, it's, it's been really great. Yeah, I think it's a easy way to learn and get some of the, I mean, I, I fortunately, I get some of the best minds in the country to yeah, talk about Yeah, you've had a diverse life. array of, of scientists yeah. on, too. Yeah, um, I've learned a lot. And then, uh, do you have any other projects? I know you said you're putting together that show in hopes to do a special with it. Anything else that you can talk about yet or you no know, not really I mean I have other I have other shows that I'm that I'm working on that I haven't that I haven't like tried out yet um, so the idea is just to get this show about psychedelics filmed and then really start focusing on I'm gonna start focusing on changing my my regular club act right now is like it's not uh, it's just a bunch of jokes which mm -hmm. is fine people like that uh, but but it's all it's all stuff that it would never be a special or an album or anything I just wouldn't do that and um, so I'm uh, trying to put together more of a thematic show yeah again is the idea well I would love to see a good trip on a special 
Yeah. I think it would be, and I agree with you as far as because there's a lot of physical elements to to watching the show. So you're right; it would be better filmed than just an audio. It yeah, just, ideally. So if I can get someone to put up the money and <laughs> film it and sell it for me, yeah. so I'm not going to give anything about it away. But if anyone gets a chance to go out and see you, what what? What cities right now are you doing it in? Well, right now I just have, um, I have, when's this come out? Um, I should be working on editing it this week, okay. and hopefully by the weekend for sure. Yeah, well, on, on Sunday I'm in Dallas doing it, and um, following Wednesday I'm in Albuquerque okay. doing it. and then Albuquerque I'm, uh, would be a great place for it. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I've never been to Albuquerque, but yeah. that's what I hear. And then, um, it, like, I, I'm gonna be back in in, in um, San Antonio in July. I'll I'll, awesome. I'll I'll be doing it again. And who knows? I might I might try to line up Austin around that time Excellent. too. So so yeah, we'll see. Um, so we can find you at. Um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm at Shane Comedy. And you can go to Shane Moss, M A U S S dot com, and find out more information about my podcast and watch my Conan videos and everything else. And then your podcast, Here We Are, can be found on, I know, iTunes. Is it also on Stitcher or? Um, yeah, it's on Stitcher. And I think it's on, I think it's on most of any right. app. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to think what else we need to cover. I think that we got it. Um, definitely this should be up by this weekend. Uh, you can go to ComedyWham.com. There'll be links to, we usually post as a YouTube, and there'll be a little article to coincide with it. But uh, thank you so much for joining oh, thank us. thank you. This has been great. Well, I hope you enjoyed our interview as much as I did. For more information on Shane and his latest projects, go to ShaneMoss.com. And for our archive of more great interviews with our regular host, Valerie, visit ComedyWham.com. Thanks.